Welcome to New Life. We are uh, we're going to be singing here in just a minute. Um, I was tasked with picking out songs this week, and uh, Saturday I was thinking a lot about how what songs we would sing, and I wanted to do something that was kind of different. I wanted to kind of like highlight the process of salvation. And uh, when you think about getting saved and what the, the path was for each of us, it, it pretty much is the same. And what it starts with, it starts with God. It starts with Jesus, right? We can't save ourselves. There's nothing we can do of our own. And so the first three songs that we're going to sing today are about Jesus. Number one, he loves us. Number two, he sets the rules. He's an almighty, all-powerful God, and it's his way and only his way. And number three, he makes a way. He made a way for us. And that's going to be what we start with today. So enjoy and listen as we sing this song, and then you'll join in with us as we sing King of Kings. Spoke a 
Shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. and we'll sing King of Kings. Praise the Son, praise the Spirit. 
even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. One more time. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness, my a way for you when it seems that there's no way say amen amen if he's ever worked a miracle in your life where only a miracle would do say amen, amen. listen to me you ready if he's ever kept his promise because his promises are true say amen this morning amen. I don't know where you are right now I don't know what you're going through but I know this whatever way you're going through He's the way maker and he's faithful and he's good and he's true. Sometimes it doesn't, you ready? It doesn't feel good. But when it doesn't feel good, he's still good. When it doesn't feel like things are going right, he's still the way maker. Amen. And uh, I think that was extremely appropriate this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much for that song. Um, this week was a, uh, it was a difficult week for some families in our church and uh, one was the Santana's uh, Amanda's father in uh, Brazil she called me middle of the week and said hey uh, dad's really not doing well uh, he's in the hospital he's struggling and uh, the next day she found out he had passed away and so if you would pray for the Santana family uh, I know that is a very difficult thing for them and uh, they would definitely appreciate uh, your prayers. Continue to pray for the Villanueva family. Uh, I love uh, Kalia, and uh, she is such a blessing, and we love Jonah and Liz. This week was, uh, was Dad's birthday, and uh, so it was a difficult week, uh, but we, got, we rest in this, that it was probably the best birthday he's ever had, because he had a birthday uh, with the one who gave him birth, and that was Jesus, and so we rejoice in that. But be in prayer for Kalia and Liz and the family. Uh, we are so thankful for them, and uh, I just want to stop for a moment before we even get in the announcements, and uh, let's just pray. Let's pray for families in our church that are hurting, families that are going through stuff, and uh, let's pray that the God of all comfort would do just that, they comfort, and uh, we know He's faithful to do that. Father, we love You, and we are so thankful for You. Uh, as we approach this service today, our, our hearts are full because we know that we can rest in our salvation. But at the same time, uh, we're still a part of this broken world. And this broken world, in the midst of all the brokenness, it's, it's hard sometimes. It's difficult. And honestly, as your children, we yearn for your kingdom. But Father, while we're here in this place, I pray that you would comfort our hearts. I pray that you would get glory to yourself through our lives and in moments and circumstances where we feel there is no way. I pray that we would look to you God, you are the way maker. I pray that when we look at things and we see that there doesn't just seem to be anything happening, that we would rest in the fact that you, God, are accomplishing things we can't see. And God, I pray that we trust in you because you, God, are good. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the salvation we sing about. And this morning, I pray that if there's one here that doesn't know you as Savior, they're here and they've never placed faith in you, I pray that today would be that day that they begin a relationship with you, that their eternity be settled, and that they would understand the great friend that we have in Jesus. We love you and we praise you. We pray that you be glorified in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's church said, Amen. Amen. 
Hey, listen, I love you. It's a good day. Uh, we're glad that you're here. If you're a guest with us this morning, uh, we want to welcome you. We're actually, for the first time in uh, seven months or so, uh, if you're a guest with us, we're going to give you a welcome card, and we want to welcome you to our service. Uh, but if you're here and this is your first time here, we just want to slip a welcome card in your hand. These guys will hold their breath before they give it to you, uh, but we'd like to put that in your hand. If you just slip your hand up, we want to welcome you. We will not embarrass you, anything like that. Uh, but these guys would love to slip a card in your hand. At the end of the service, well, on your way out, we uh, have a box there for our offering. And uh, if as uh, people are giving offerings, if you want to just slip that card in, uh, we'd love to have a record of your visit. And uh, anything we can do to pray for you, there's a thing on the back of that card with a prayer request. We'd love to do that. And I'd love to be a blessing to you. We are continuing our series this morning, Minor Figures, Major Impact. And I'm excited about that. I'm looking forward to that time together. Uh, we've gone through some great Bible characters and we've learned some great lessons. Uh, that'll continue this morning. And so we're thankful for that. Uh, don't forget to use social media uh, to invite your friends, your family to church with you. Uh, if you're here today, check in. Say, hey, I'm at church next week. Come with me. And uh, I know that'll be a blessing uh, to those around you. Uh, tonight, 6 p.m., our family service. And uh, we're actually going to take part of the message from this morning. We're going to take a part of the text, a portion of the text, and we're going to look at that in depth and detail tonight at six. If you're part of our church family, if this is your home church, I'm your pastor, this is your church, these are your people, uh, please be here at six tonight. I think this will be a great encouragement to you, and uh, I am excited about it, prayed over it, uh, just pumped about what the Lord has for us tonight. And so 6 p.m. tonight, our family service, uh, please be here, be in your place. This Wednesday night, 7 p.m., small groups, and uh, we're excited about the teens, the young uh, the young adults, adults, uh, the kids, everybody, this uh, Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Listen, if your kids, if your teens, if they're not here on Wednesday night, they're missing out every week uh, in the kids department. Miss Mindy, Brother Trent, uh, they do a great job with our kids. This week, I got to teach the kids, and I was pumped because I got to play with balloons. And we pretended like we were walking around the walls of Jericho. And our neighbors saw us walking around. We had, listen, we had an Ark of the Covenant, okay? And we were walking around the building, and uh, we had a great time. We had balloons. The walls of Jericho, this is just a crash history course for you, because I'm still excited about it. Walls of Jericho were about 30 feet high. Uh, how do you know that? They found them in 1929. They excavated the ruins of Jericho, so they're about 30 feet high. So I went to Dollar Tree, and I got a bunch of helium balloons, right? And I asked them, can I have some extra string? And they said, well, how much? And I said, well, I need like four strings that are 30 foot long. And they're looking at me like, what are you doing? But we tied those helium balloons around and we had balloons 30 feet up in there. And you could see the kids' minds explode when we looked up at those balloons and we're like, wow, that was a big city. By the way, the walls came tumbling down because that's the power of our God. Amen. Uh, but we have a great time on Wednesday night. I want to encourage you to be a part of that. And then on Thursday morning, our senior Bible study, 9 a.m. And that's definitely an exciting time as well. We have a great time of fellowship. Let me throw this out there. On Sunday mornings, we have the cafe open now. And so Sunday mornings, we'll have coffee, we'll have water, uh, cream or sugar, all that jazz. Uh, this morning, uh, we had some donuts and muffins and all kinds of good stuff in there. And so I want to encourage you to get here a little early on Sunday morning, take part in that. Love My Church project, we're moving forward. Uh, we've got the roof going to be starting here in just probably a couple weeks here. Uh, really excited about that, moving forward on the construction. And so we have a surveyor that's supposed to be out the, either this week or the next, uh, just moving us forward on that. So we're excited and looking forward to all that God God has for us. How many of you like bowling? Raise your hand. How many of you are good at bowling? How many of you just like to throw stuff? Yeah, there we go. It's a good way to get out of aggression. Teen Activity Bowling Night, Saturday, October 3rd, uh, 7 p.m. If you have any questions and you are a teenager or have a teenager, uh, see Pastor Stephen in the back there after the service, and he'd love to give you more information about that. And then lastly, uh, not this Sunday night, but next Sunday night, uh, we are beginning a new Sunday evening series entitled Trust the Process. Trust the Process. 
And we're going to talk about developing daily disciplines as we walk with the Lord. If you are a new Christian, this would be a great series for you. If you are a old Christian, this would be a great series for you. Uh, it's going to be a challenge to daily walk with Jesus and what that looks like. Uh, salvation is amazing, is it not? Uh, salvation is when we meet Jesus, when we place our faith in Him, our eternity is settled, we have the Holy Spirit that enters into us. That's awesome, but we're still on this earth, right? In the process of growing closer to Jesus, we call that sanctification. And this series is going to talk about that process, the process of sanctification. And so I want to encourage you to be here. When is it? Sunday nights? What time? Say it louder. I can't hear you. Plus, I want to hold you accountable because I'll say, no, you told me it was 6 o'clock, right? All right. Man, I'm thankful you're here today, and I'm looking forward to a great day in the Lord's house. Uh, we're going to continue in worship in just a moment, but Brother Greg, you come on up here, and uh, he's going to pray for the rest of our service. Yellow mic there, uh, Zachary. Uh, how many of you like what you see around here? Amen. And Greg, and the truth is, Robin is the one who does most of it, uh, but they've done a tremendous job. We're so thankful for them. So Greg, you pray for us. Uh, Stephen, let's continue in worship. Let's pray. Lord, we love you this morning. We've heard uh, about some prayer requests here in our church family today, loss and remembrance. We know there's a lot of burdens that weren't expressed here today. Well, I want to pray specifically for our pastor, for Brother Jonathan, the reminder of the pressures, the stresses, the burdens that are shared with him all week long by our members here and those burdens he carries. I pray that we'll carry those unknown burdens with him. Lord, you set up this, this system where you know everything and you can do everything and yet you wait for us to ask. The responsibility falls back on us to admit out loud that you're all powerful, to admit all, out loud that you're in control of everything and that we can do nothing without your help. So Lord, help us to remember to pray for our pastor for his wife as she tries to share the burdens that he's carrying as they lead us in the direction we're supposed to go. Be with our pastor today as he speaks to us. Um, be with the Sunday school teachers as they speak in the children's services. And I pray that you help us to open our hearts and our minds. And that we'll leave here different than we came in with a different perspective. A reminder of things we've known that we've let slip or a new area to Start working on correct, to grow, become a better example of you to the world around us. Our world is definitely in turmoil today, and you are the peacemaker. You're all powerful. You know what's right. You know what's perfect. And as your followers, help us to be examples of that. Not examples of chaos, but examples of calm in the storm. We love you. We thank you for all you've done for us. Meet with us today in Jesus' name. Amen. As you stand and sing with us, the next couple of songs we're going to sing are about our response to salvation. The first thing we have to do is we have to realize that we're a sinner. There's nothing we can do, and we got to come to Jesus just as we are. Sing this hymn with us, Just As I Am. Just as I
And not only do we have to realize we're a sinner, but we have to come. We have to, we have to do the step of coming to him. And that's why we're going to sing this song, Oh, Come to the Altar. so much for your attention. Kids can be dismissed. Junior church, kiddos, you guys can be dismissed. You know, I was thinking about uh, what we sing there and what we uh, give semi-apathetic acknowledgement to. 
Uh, there are men and women in the Bible uh, and, and throughout history who died uh, for. You say, Jonathan, what are you talking about? Apathetic acknowledgement to the fact, yeah, Christ rose from the dead. Sure, sure. Look at a man this morning who gave his life for that thought. And uh, I'm just telling you, we have a lot to be thankful for. We have a lot to be grateful for. I'm thankful that when we come and uh, we sit and we listen to the Word of God that we're presented uh, with God's Word. And I do my best to not give you my opinion or uh, my thoughts about matters, but I try to give you what the Bible says. Because the truth is, I have no th authority apart from the Bible. I have nothing worth saying apart from telling you this is what God says. And uh, the Bible says in James, uh, James chapter number 1, that... And uh, be a hearer of the word, not a doer. He's like unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. So he challenges this church here at the very beginning that's split off from Jerusalem. As a result of what we'll actually see this morning, he says, uh, when you're presented with the word of God, it's like a mirror that shows you where you stand. And as you see where you stand... Many people will see where they stand and they'll acknowledge it and they'll just turn away and walk away uh, forgetting what manner of man we were. What are you saying? I'm saying the truth of God's word should confront us where we are and say, this is where we are. And the reason we sing a song like, I'll come to the altar is because when we're confronted with who we are in light of God's word and God's spirit, we have a responsibility to respond to that. And say, God, you've confronted me with where I am. Help me to grow and help me to change and help me to mature. And so when we sing a song like, Oh, come to the altar, here's the heart behind that. I believe with all my heart that every time God's word is spoken, we have a responsibility to respond to that. And so I would encourage you this morning not to just be an audience, but be a congregation of God's people that are listening to God's word and looking at ourselves in the mirror of God's word and saying, God, what needs to change in my life? Worship team, thank you for the intentionality of the worship. That was a great blessing uh, this morning. How's everybody doing today? Everybody, everybody good? good? Marvelous, marvelous. That's a Cindy answer for sure. I am, uh, I'm thankful for the chance to continue in the series that we started a few weeks back. We're going to look at a character by the name of Stephen. Now, don't let any uh, presuppositions about people named Stephen. We have a bunch of Stevens uh, in our church. They're all bums. Uh, don't... <laughs> Uh, don't let your view of this Stephen be hindered by those Stevens. Uh, Stephen Silverson, Steve uh, Borg were back there. And uh, they're like, oh, you're preaching on my name. And I said, yeah, the good one. And uh, they, they laughed. Uh, Stephen Anderson, sorry, you just got caught up in that, man. Guilty uh, by association there. Um, a few years after Pentecost in Acts 2, the apostles are continuing in growth, and the church is growing in Jerusalem. Uh, but really, they haven't left Jerusalem to proclaim the gospel anywhere else yet. It's kind of it's kind of just grown there, and it is developing there. Uh, but that's soon going to change, and the catalyst for this change uh, will be the story that we look at this morning. It's going to be the death of a minor figure who made a major impact, and really, uh, the life of Stephen was the catalyst uh, for the gospel uh, spreading out of Jerusalem, uh, for it igniting. Really, uh, we see the letter. Uh, from James. James was the pastor of the church at Jerusalem, writing to believers that had scattered from Jerusalem after uh, what we see here in Acts 6 and 7. And so really, uh, any time that we see persecution in the Bible, we also see the gospel igniting, and we see the gospel just spreading uh, because of persecution. And, and my prayer for our nation is that as we see persecution, and, and it, it almost feels Feels, uh, it almost feels a cheapening to the word persecution to call what we're seeing persecution. But nonetheless, there is definitely a persecution of Christianity right now. My prayer is that as we see uh, this happening, that the gospel would flourish, that Christians uh, would rise up and be counted, that we would care about eternal things rather than temporal things, and that we would care more about eternity than November. Can I say that? Is that okay? Yeah. 
And so my prayer is that persecution would just ignite a flame in America that would spread throughout our country and the world uh, for the cause of Christ. I was encouraged, by the way, yesterday to see in Washington, D.C., uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of people gathered together to pray uh, for our nation. I was encouraged to see our vice president stand there and talk about uh, our nation's responsibility to turn to God in times of chaos. And uh, man, I was encouraged uh, by that. And I believe that as a church, we have a responsibility to seek God's face as a nation. Uh, we ought to do that. And uh, I was tremendously encouraged by that. But nonetheless, persecution started here in Acts 6 and 7. We see that persecution igniting a flame uh, that really led to uh, tremendous, tremendous growth uh, in the church, in the kingdom uh, as well. In chapter number 6 of Acts, verses number 1 through 7, Luke uh, tells us that a group called the Hellenist uh, started complaining about their widows that were being uh, neglected in the daily uh, administration or the charitable uh, contributions of the church. And we'll talk more about who these people were in just a moment. Uh, and tonight, we're actually going to look at this a little more in depth as well. But Acts chapter 6, uh, verse number 1, if you're there, uh, say amen. If you, amen. If you didn't say amen, you didn't look on the screen because it's right there. Uh, but Acts chapter 6, verse number 1, let's read down to verse number 7. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied... There arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Now, pause for just a moment. We're talking about in the early days of the church, we're talking about a mixed uh, congregations uh, of believers. We're talking about some uh, uh, with a Hebrew heritage. We're talking about some with a, a Grecian heritage. Uh, uh, by reading, what I can understand is there were something like 400 plus synagogues within Jerusalem. So there is a ton of different assemblies. Uh, some would believe that the Messiah had not yet come. Some would be groups of people that had placed faith in Christ. We'll see later on in, in the narrative, I think tonight actually, uh, we'll see that several of the priests uh, believe that Christ was the Messiah, and so there's tremendous growth there. But there's a multitude of different congregations within Jerusalem uh, and, and just spread out according to location and whatnot. And so we have the Greeks, uh, the Grecians, the Hellenists, uh, and the Hebrews. And they're, uh, they're having a, 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 a bit of a uh, battle here, really, about how things are going. Uh, Acts 6 2. Then the twelve. Uh, called the multitude of the disciples unto them. And so these would have been the leaders. This would have been a great congregation of those leading these assemblies and things like that. And said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen. And notice what the Bible says about Stephen. A man full of faith and the Holy Ghost. And Philip and Procurus and Nisanor and Timon and Pumba. It's not there, just kidding. Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And look at what happens in verse number 7. In the word of God, what's the word? Increased. It grew, right? And the number of the disciples, what's the word? Multiplied. We like to see increase. We like to see multiplication, whether it's in our bank account. Can somebody say amen right there? Yes. Uh, within the church, with the gospel, we love to see a growth, do we not, right? And number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. A great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now let's take a look at some of the background here before we get into some of our observation. Really, what I'm going to do is I'm going to recap this whole scenario, and then we're going to take an in-depth, uh, a little bit deeper of a look at Stephen uh, here this morning. So Hellenists, they're Jews who speak Greek as a first language. 
Uh, they probably understood very little uh, Hebrew or Aramaic. They would have been Jews that had lived outside of, uh, of Palestine but had moved to Jerusalem at some point in their adult lives. Uh, Jesus grew up in Palestine, uh, Judea, Samaria, Galilee, and he spoke primarily Aramaic and Hebrew uh, with Greek as a second language. Now, in this day, devout Greek-speaking uh, Jewish men would often move with their wives uh, to Jerusalem or the surrounding area so that they could live their final years uh, in the Holy Land near the temple. As it was, the husbands would uh, generally die first and they would leave behind widows who had uh, no nearby family to care for them. And that's where we see the, the command here and the dispute over the care of widows. Jews took it very seriously uh, to obey the biblical commands to care for uh, widows. And the way they would operate as groups of people, and this is prior to Jesus as the Messiah, this is just a Jewish tradition. There were weekly and daily distributions to widows. According to researchers, the daily distribution typically consisted of food, so like bread and beans and fruit, uh, whereas the weekly distribution uh, was more like long-term food and then clothing. So uh, immediate needs daily, uh, more long-term needs uh, weekly. And the early church took this system that had been initiated prior to them, and they were uh, likely implementing the same sort of, of system, right? Which, by the way, let me just say this, pure religion, the Bible tells us in James 1.27, always looks to meet needs of those less fortunate than ourselves. Yes, uh, meet the needs of those uh, that have them. Now, we're not told in this passage why it is that these Grecian or Hellenist widows are being ignored. Uh, likely, I, I feel, uh, as a pastor, I believe it was probably due to, to church growth. And you say, well, Jonathan, what do you mean? Well, as you grow, it's hard to keep track of everything, right? And as the church here, that's coming from me as a pastor with a relatively small congregation comparatively, right? Uh, it is hard as the church grows to keep track of, of everything. And even though there was a multitude of leaders, a plurality here of leaders within the church at Jerusalem, still it is not uncommon for things to, you ready, fall through the cracks. And I believe that's probably what happened here. The apostles are dealing likely with thousands of people uh, the Bible tells us that Acts 2, thousands of people came to faith, and so it's a relatively large uh, group of people. And the Jewish, uh, uh, Hebrew, uh, native, you ready, um, disciples likely would not have been as familiar with the Greek-speaking widows or the Hellenistic widows that would have come in and moved in. They wouldn't, just wouldn't have been as familiar uh, with them. In any case, the apostles say, hey, listen, we need to focus on prayer and preaching and teaching, and that's where our focus needs to be. But these people need to be taken care of as well. And so they summon the apostles, the disciples summon the leaders of the different uh, groups of people there. They summon them together and they say, okay, from amongst you, uh, choose seven men that can take over the administration of the daily and weekly needs of the people. And that's what we see uh, in, in, in this passage in verse number six, uh, ver, or chapter, I'm sorry, chapter number six, verse number three. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, who we may appoint over this business. So they say, we have a need here. Let's meet this need. By the way, here, uh, this is kind of getting into what we'll talk about tonight. Uh, but there was a problem, and they said, okay, there's a problem here. Let's nip it in the bud. Let's address the problem. And what was happening here, I believe with all my heart, is Satan was trying to destroy the church just as it was getting started by causing dissension among the congregation. And the apostle said, you know what, fooey on that. Let's, we have a need here. Let's fix it. Let's deal with it, whatever. And as a result of the way this was handled, listen to me, please. As a result of the way this was handled, uh, the kingdom doesn't take a hit for Satan's attack here, right? Uh, they say, okay, let's find some people, let's appoint them over this business, let's meet this need. And as a result, at the end of this passage, we see that the word grew and the disciples grew and the, the influence was increased, right? Because this was handled uh, well. By the way, this is just a free tidbit. Anytime there's growth, Satan wants to destroy it. 
Anytime, listen to me, anytime the church gains momentum, Satan wants to hinder that momentum. And so don't think for a moment, I said before we got into this building program, I said we're going to see people come that haven't come before. We're going to see new people. We're going to see growth. God's going to do some things. But don't stop uh, putting, don't stop guarding your heart because know this, Satan wants to do anything he can to destroy the work of God. Amen? And there will be murmurings and disputings over colors and choices and blah, blah, blah. And uh, if you don't like the color of anything in this church, blame it on Greg. It's all his fault, and he's leaving, so he doesn't care. Okay? Uh, that was a, was a joke, but it's really true. He chose, so I don't have to take the fall for it. So if you don't like something, sorry, he chose. Uh, and that was a blessing. It does look good. Amen. Yes. Okay. That's why it looks so good, because I didn't have the truth. She said, mic drop from the front row. Okay. <laughs> So we see Satan trying to destroy. We see uh, this being worked through. Uh, we see God getting glory through this. But here in this passage in chapter 6 is where we first see Stephen introduced. Now it's interesting to me, and I don't know if you caught it, but as we are reading, reading verse number 5 and we're reading of these seven men, the Bible tells us first of Stephen, and it says, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. Then as we hear of the other six men, there's no description of them whatsoever. Okay, it could be because Stephen was martyred and so we felt it fitting to explain who he was and that would make logical sense. Could be that Stephen stuck out from the rest. And I believe in chapter number seven, as we read this narrative, I believe we'll see that he did in fact stick out uh, from the rest and he was a man uniquely, you ready? Uniquely used by God to accomplish great things within this church and within these early believers. However it is, we see in chapter number 6, Stephen enters the picture, but we see he exits stage left the next chapter. And that's where we glean that he's a minor figure that made a major impact. We see him in two chapters of Scripture, but we see his... You ready for this? We see the impact he made throughout the rest of the New Testament in reality. We see the church scatter. We see Paul... Uh, who is privy to this persecution that we'll see in just a moment, we see him influenced and I believe convicted and impacted by the death of Stephen. We see the gospel flourish as a result of one man's faithfulness and obedience where God placed him. And I believe that we can learn a lot of great lessons from Stephen. And so in Acts chapter number 6, starting in verse 8, Luke writes that... Stephen is performing miracles, preaching at a, a specific uh, synagogue. Uh, this would have likely included former Roman slaves, Jews from other parts of the Roman empires, uh, or the Roman Empire. Some members of this synagogue, this congregation, they, uh, they are not happy. And they begin to argue with Stephen. They begin to discredit his teaching. But really, and the Bible says in this narrative, and we'll see in just a moment, his words are irrefutable because he's filled with the Spirit of God. He's speaking God's truth. And so what can you say against the truth of God? If you think back to Jesus and you think back to his accusers and you think back to the, uh, the charges of blasphemy brought against him by lying witnesses, this whole story sounds very similar to what had just happened with Jesus. What are you saying? They did not learn their lesson. They did not learn their lesson. And so since they cannot silence Stephen with arguing with him and trying to convince him, otherwise they pull out the old trick out of the bag. Let's accuse him of blasphemy. And so Stephen's arrested. He's brought before the Sanhedrin. Uh, can I say the corrupt Sanhedrin? Uh, to defend himself. And so look in verse number 8 of chapter 6. Stephen, and once again a description of him full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. They were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. So then they suborned men. They summoned, they bribed men which said... We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. 
And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. Uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, different groups uh, protesting. Uh, some resemble mobs more than they resemble protesters, right? And this is a mob of protesters that uh, capture this man and bring him to the council. They set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. This had to have been a pretty unique scenario. He's being accused, and yet there was a visible difference to where that the Bible says all that sat in the council as they looked on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Now, I have never seen an angel. I don't know what it looked like, but I've heard they don't, uh, they have quite the radiant countenance, right? I'm telling you, homeboy was glowing. And when they saw Stephen, they saw something happening that was, you ready? Abnormal. Ready for another word? It was epic. Jonathan, what does epic mean? Epic means surpassing the ordinary. I don't think that ordinarily people walked around looking like the face of an angel. But as he's being accused, they're looking and they see something different and they say, uh, they, they see the face of an angel. What is going on here? You would think that that would act as a deterrent, that maybe some people would look at this and think twice and be like, you know what, let's pair Jesus and the whole resurrection thing that I was a little bit pessimistic about, but you match this in and you see the work that's being done here. I mean, you'd think something would click here. Are you listening to me? But they stand up in verse number 13 and they say, This man ceases, ceases not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. And by the way, as he begins speaking in verse number, or chapter number 7, that's, a, that's exactly what he addresses. Their concern is his blasphemy against the temple, against the synagogue. And so in chapter number 7, he just lays out a bunch of history and basically goes through the covenant promises to Abraham and Moses and fast forward and then basically says Jesus Christ was the culmination of prophecy. He was really the tangible uh, uh, fixture of our faith and you guys are still worshiping this building and the laws that were given to you by Moses when he promised in the Old Testament the Messiah and he came and he died and he rose again and you guys are still stuck on this building. And these laws. And so in chapter 6, he's blas said blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we've heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. They were so stuck on the building and the traditions that they could not see Jesus. And I'm afraid that happens way too much in our culture as well. Listen to me. Stuck on the building, and the tradition, and missing out on Jesus. So Stephen's response to these allegations, we see it in chapter number 7, verse number 2 to verse number 53. And for sake of time, I'm going to just kind of summarize the speech there before picking up the narrative uh, down in verse number 51. At first, if you read through, and I would encourage you to go back and read through chapter number 7, he is speaking to a bunch of Jewish people, and he says, essentially, uh, he, he's going through Jewish history, he's going through the biblical history there, and he's essentially saying, the fulfillment of all your worship was Jesus, and when you rejected Jesus as the Messiah, you essentially rejected everything that this building and these laws are about. When you rejected Jesus, you rejected God himself. And so look at verse number 51. He gives this big spill, gives this big narrative. And by the way, he was bold, he was powerful, he was honest, and he was killed for it. 
many of us struggle to stand our ground for the sake of truth because it hurts to stand for truth. We're just going to deviate for just a moment here, but this is, this is worth... Some of us are afraid to say, I believe that this is right or wrong based on the authority of the Bible. We're afraid to do that because of what it will cost us. Amen. You know, the first thing that for some reason we don't want to sacrifice, we don't want to sacrifice relationships. Well, if I say that, it's going to hurt this person and it's going to cause this effect. And so I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. And at the end of the day, God will deal. Listen to me. Here's a man that has just seen, you listen to me, just seen the Messiah murdered very publicly, very shamefully in the way they went about it, very graphically right in front of him. And he's dealing with the same group of people, same city even. And he's challenged, you ready, the same way, eerily reminiscent of what just happened with Jesus. And yet when they give him a microphone, they give him an audience and they say, speak your truth. Here's his truth. Jesus is the Messiah. He was the long-awaited one. He's the one promised. When Abraham uh, had his covenant made from God, and God said, I'll make of you a great nation, and all through the history of you. Listen, God, Jesus was the fulfillment of the promises of God. When he was given his moment, he seized it, regardless of what it would cost him. You know what lesson that just, just screams to me? That screams to me that truth is more important than my Comfort. Amen. You know what it screams to me? That my faith ought to lead me. Amen. Yeah. I've said for weeks, and I'll say for weeks longer, we are in a pivotal moment in the history of our nation. Amen. And I know some of you have been around a lot longer than I, but in my lifetime, this is undoubtedly the most pivotal moment of our nation. And I'm not, by the way, I'm not necessarily talking about November. I'm not talking about the election. I'm talking about we are making some decisions and we are facing some things right now in our nation that will determine trajectory for years and years and years and years to come. Right now is a time to stand up for what the Bible says is truth. Amen. We're about to have a resurgence of conversation about life and the sanctity of it. And right now is a time where Christians need to stand for life. Amen. Life in any color. Amen. Life in any form. Life. All right. And by the way, when I'm saying form, I'm not talking about aliens, okay? <clears throat> okay. Life. In verse number 51 of chapter number 7, he summarized the history lesson, <laughs> or he's given his history lesson. In verse number 51, he just gets straight to the point. You ready? Ye stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. By the way, <laughs> calling them uncircumcised, whether it be any part of their body or their heart or their ear. Listen, that was quite the affront. That was quite the offense. He went for the jugular. Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have, your fa have not your fathers persecuted? By the way, I'm not sure what was happening here. I don't know if they're screaming and yelling at him. Shut up, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I don't know if it was drop dead silent. That's the way I want to picture it in my mind. But they weren't exactly known for being a silent people. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? What he's saying here is how many men have come and spoken truth to you in times of national turmoil and you gave them literal hell for it. You gave them tremendous grief for it. 
They've slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one. He's saying those who prophesied, those who prophesied Jesus is coming, you slew them. Of whom now ye or of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. That's interesting that he says that because they prided themselves in what? O obeying the law. But what is the first and greatest commandment of the law? They were missing the first part. They were missing what Jesus came to his commandment, and that was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. They're saying you got, you got the tenets, but you missed what the law was about. And so as he says this, he starts out with you uncircumcised in heart and ears. Whoa, who's he think he is? And he finishes with, you've received the law and you have not kept it. And that, my friends, is the straw that broke the camel's back. Verse number 44, or 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. We said verse 53 was the straw that broke the camel's back, but think about this. Stephen says, I see the Son of God, Jesus, <laughs> the one you crucified, standing on the right hand of the Father. In their minds, he's attacking the very uniqueness of God by saying there's one standing next to him in heaven, the Son of Man. That's what Jesus was known by. That's what Jesus called himself and others called him. And so he is attacking who God is by saying, I see God and Jesus is next to him. And here's what happens. They had accused him of blasphemy, but in their minds, he just fulfilled the blasphemy. You ready? So, fooey on due process, fooey on figuring this out and dealing with it, right? Forget bringing him before the Sanhedrin, having, uh, having the verdict given to him, and then dishing out the verdict. No, no, no. Verse number 57, then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. They stoned Stephen. Stephen was calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He, he died. The Jews that are stoning him are acting exactly as their ancestors had. Their ancestors had persecuted and killed God's prophets. They themselves had persecuted and killed the Messiah. I have a feeling that Stephen probably had a lot more to say, but he never has the chance. The audience rages, loses their collective mind, charges upon him, takes him and kills him. A few years ago, um, the coronavirus didn't dominate our headlines. There was a lot of talk about Middle Eastern Christians being killed by Muslims. I remember, I don't remember how it was, I think I was on Facebook and something popped up that hadn't been censored and there's a video of a person being stoned for their faith. And it came up and it popped up and it's there and it's... It's 
hard to see somebody lose their life. Stoning is an incredibly brutal way to lose a life. And the rage that fills an audience of people who thinks they are righteous and the callousness that that takes place with and the complete hatred And in the middle of a hateful moment, Stephen emulates his Savior, who in the middle of a hateful moment said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In this passage, Stephen, in the midst of being stoned, with many broken bones, with a broken body, with the last moments of his life, says, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. They say you can look at a person's last moments and tell a lot about them. We're not privy to everyone's last moments, but we get a we get a pretty detailed glimpse into Stevens. And in the midst of hate, he shows grace. I think Christians could learn a lot from that. In my life, I've never seen the world so hateful. And I know I'm young. I'm wet behind the ears. Barely. Barely. Easy, Cindy. You're you're treading on dangerous ground today. Cindy, we know. In the midst of hatred, grace was shown. Can I tell you the reason he was able to do that in that moment is not because that was an abnormality in his life, but because that was normal for him. So the Bible gives us insight into the character of Stephen. Now, I told you I'm going to end the sermon today with just a summarization of his character. And I'll not be long. I literally have maybe one page of notes. But let's look at the life of Stephen. What, what was his life? Number one, the Bible says he was full of the Holy Spirit. That was one of the requirements that was made by the disciples when they said, seek ye out among you, right? Full of the Holy Spirit. And what I'm saying there is not a, a Pentecostal experience. Like he's, he just, it's a daily walk under control of the Holy Spirit. He was led by the Spirit. He was obedient to the Spirit. The Bible says that that was evident in chapter number 6, verse number 10, when his opponents or his accusers couldn't cope with his wisdom and the spirit which he was speaking. The power behind his speech, it came from the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the crazy part. You ready? Jesus had told his disciples back in Luke 12 that they would be delivered up before synagogues and rulers. And that in that moment, the Holy Spirit would teach them what they had to say. I want you to hear this. Luke chapter 12, Jesus speaking to his disciples. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Fear God. (laughs) Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? And not one of them is forgotten before God. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Also I say unto you, whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. And when they bring you into the synagogues, under the synagogues, you ready? 
and unto magistrates and powers. Take, not, take no thought how or what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say. What are you saying? I'm saying that as he's standing here and he's defending himself, he did not rehearse this. He did not have it written down a four time. He had given no thought to it. I'm saying in that moment, the Spirit of God gave him the words to say, Jonathan, where do you get that? The Bible, Acts 7.55. But he, what's the words? Being full of the Holy Ghost. The Bible tells us that in that moment, he was full of the Holy Ghost. Listen to me, that wasn't the first time. And the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of being filled with the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, those are not produced overnight. Those are not produced by some Pentecostal experience. They're produced over months and years of obedience to the Spirit of God. They're produced by spiritual disciplines and spiritual habits. They're produced by obedience to the Spirit. This, this series that we'll start on Sunday night in two weeks, uh, Trust the Process. It's the process of saying yes when God says yes, or saying no when God says no. Stephen was a man accustomed to being filled with the Holy Ghost. Why? Because he was obedient to Him. And, and the fullness of the Spirit, that is, that is progressive maturity. As we grow, we are filled with the Spirit of God. He was full of wisdom. In chapter number 6, verse number 3, that was one of the other requirements. It's funny, the Greek word for wisdom is only used four times in Acts. And they all take place in chapter 6 and 7. Two of them describing Stephen... And twice in his message before the Sanhedrin. Wisdom comes from a Hebrew word it mean, meaning skill. It's used of a craftsman who, who had the skill to make the tabernacle, the furniture that went in it. It's the skill to live a life that's truly beautiful. It's right conduct in obedience to the will of God. Not just mastering a body of knowledge. There's a difference in knowledge and wisdom. Wisdom is application of knowledge. He was also full of faith. Full of faith. Jonathan, how do you know he was full of faith? I'm glad you asked. The Bible tells us. <laughs> but chapter number 7 is a beautiful picture of his faith. He defends it. He says from the beginning, he begins to recap the history. He essentially gives his belief system. He says, this is how I came to the point where I put my faith in the Messiah. This is where my, my belief system has developed. Chapter 7 is a defense of his faith. It's an, what's, what's known as an apology of his faith. Chapter number 7. And he's standing here knowing that this will likely cost him his life, and he's still showing faith. And then the last thing we said as we were jumping into these descriptions of Stephen was that he was full of grace. The Bible says that Jesus was full of grace and truth in John 1, 14. Jesus was, in fact, God's grace personified. But with Stephen, what is very clear to us is that he had a personal understanding and experience of God's grace that was revealed in his conduct here. Salvation is not by our works of righteousness. It is not by our good deeds or our good behavior. Salvation is not earned by merit. Salvation is freely given by the grace of God. Amen. And so our conduct, our conduct upon receiving grace ought be grace. Our behavior ought to be grace. We live in a graceless culture. 
we live in a culture where grace is absent. The world knows to sing of amazing grace. Even the unchurched could hum along. But to actually live it out is foreign. And as this crowd crushed his bones, rather than cursing them, he blesses them. He shows grace. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. When he said it, he fell asleep. Can I tell you one of the most beautiful testaments of God to an unbelieving culture is grace. Stephen, you can come if you would. <clears throat> I said at the beginning of this message in introduction that the life of Stephen was a catalyst into the growth and development of the church. It was a catalyst for persecution. I said Stephen was a minor figure who made an, a major impact to further that thought and just establish that thought. The Bible tells us that at the end of chapter 7, that there was one who held the coats or kept the coats. Tradition would tell us that typically that would be the prosecutor, the one who would bring charges. That man's name was Saul. Saul, we know, later encounters God on the road to Damascus. Uh, dramatically converted spends some time learning and then dedicates his life to turning the world upside down for the gospel, yes? I believe this. I believe Stephen's grace, the grace that Stephen showed in this moment was not just a catalyst for persecution or for growth or for... I believe it was a catalyst in the conversion of Saul to Paul. Here's what I believe. I believe that Saul had seen a lot of people die. But I don't think he had ever seen anybody die like Stephen. I really don't. I think he saw in Stephen a bit of the boldness that he had in himself. The brash belief. Say, where do you get that? He was, he was a bit brash. You uncircumcised and hardened ears. You've received the law and you don't do it. As much as that may have been against what Saul believed, I believe he could respect the fact that he said it with passion. And here's a man that's willing to give his life. But in doing so, show grace. And I believe the Spirit of God began to, you ready, prick Saul's heart. To the point that on the Damascus Road, God says to Saul, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. Yeah. I believe they never lost sight of that face. And Stephen's eyes were on Jesus' face. The reflection there. Saul saw Jesus in Stephen. You hear me? His demonstration of grace showed Christ. So Jonathan, what are you saying? I'm glad you asked. Let's bring it home. You ready? Let's land the plane. Landing gears down. In a world full of hate, grace stands out. Grace doesn't mean we sacrifice truth. If you look at this story, truth, <laughs> very evident, but seasoned with love and grace. I, uh, I hate Facebook now, like hate it, really, really hate it. Because Facebook's a bunch of feelings, and feelings aren't normally true. <laughs> And by expressing their feelings, and some people's feelings, man, they're, they're grounded in biblical truth, and they're grounded in grace, and they're grounded in whatever. And some people's feelings are just, they're, they're brutal. You ready? 
lately I have some Facebook friends that have just gone to war on Facebook against churches and pastors that are soft. That's, that's what they call them. They're soft. Tickle ears. Right? All they want to talk about is love and grace. and good. Listen to me. My heart, every time I open this word, is to give you truth unadulterated. And as much as you may feel I'm soft sometimes, I tick some people off sometimes. <laughs> there are people that do not like what I say. But my heart is to take truth and incorporate grace. Every time I speak. Because that's what I see here. Jesus was very truthful. <laughs> Jesus was confrontational. Jesus was in your face tell you what you don't want to hear confrontational but his spirit was grace what does the world need today truth grace I don't know what it takes to get the world to listen to the message that we proclaim but I think it has something to do with our behavior. And I think conduct that is seasoned with grace opens doors that other things may not. And if the world really needs the gospel, do we believe that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If the world really needs Jesus, how are they going to get it? Ye are the light of the world. Ye are the salt of the earth. But don't let our voices echo the same hate that we see outside. It's not us against them. It's Satan versus humanity. And right now we're letting him win. Father, I love you. Thank you for your word. Um, I, I know that our nation is in desperate need. And many in our nation would disagree as to what that need is. But we know through your word that the greatest need of all humanity is Jesus. That's, that's, there's no way around that. The greatest need in our culture, in our world, is Jesus. We're to be ambassadors for you. In our lives, when we placed our faith in you, we gave ourselves to you. We're no longer to let sin reign in our body. We're to live for you. We're to live for your glory. We're to sacrifice our lives for you. And God, today, I pray that you'd help us to be a people of truth. As we saw modeled in Stephen. But also a people of grace. And let the critics criticize. And let the skeptics scorn. But let the children of God stand up and show grace. We love you. We praise you for who you are. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand to your feet, eyes closed, heads bowed? So at the beginning, uh, James 1 talks about looking into the mirror of the Word of God, being confronted where we are. Talked about how foolish it was to be confronted with the Word of God and to leave it at that. So I'm going to give you just a few moments here to respond to God's word. And you can come and spend time at an altar if you want. You can respond to God's word right there in your seat. But I would encourage you to take what you've heard, process it, do business with God as he leads. And as Stephen plays, we're just going to have a moment here where we respond to him. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, our prayer and that you would come to a place of salvation 
So if you're here today and you'd like to talk to somebody about that, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray for you first. So in this moment, when nobody's looking around, if you'd be so honest as to say, Jonathan, if I died today, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. I don't know that I would spend eternity with him. And that concerns me. I'd like you to pray for me. And the quietness of this moment and the privacy of this moment, if you say, Jonathan, that's me. That's where I'm at right now. Would you pray for me? Would you slip your hand up all across this room? Nobody looking. But if you'd say, Jonathan, if I die today, I don't have a relationship with Christ. That concerns me. If you say, Jonathan, if I die today, I do know that eternity would be spent with Christ is my Savior. He is my Father and my friend. If you'd say that's me this morning all across the room, would you slip your hand up? Man, I rejoice in that. This morning, as God's spoken to your heart, I'm going to give you an opportunity here to respond to him. We'll take a few moments here. Stephen will play. You do business. Dear Lord, we thank you for this truth that we heard today from Pastor Jonathan. And we're, Lord, I pray that we would just take these truths that we've heard from your word and we look at this life of, of Stephen and just the example that he laid before us, Lord, and, and in, in the midst of um, persecution, uh, standing on truth. And Lord, my prayer is that that's how I would live my life and how this church would uh, continue forward, that we would stand on truth no matter what uh, the world does around us, no matter what decisions are made, or that we would stand on your word and stand for truth, stand for life. Lord, I pray that we would be able to do it with grace and with love, um, and that the, the world around us would see the light of you and your grace through our lives. We ask all these things in your name, amen. We're going to sing one more song. We're going to sing Resurrection Power, and then we'll be dismissed for the day. You call me from the grave by name. You call me out of all my shame. I see the old has passed away, the new has come. Now I have resurrection power, living on the inside, Jesus. You have given us freedom, no longer bound by sin and darkness. Living in the light of your goodness, you have given us freedom. And that I'm best in your royalty. Your Holy Spirit lives in me. Assessment past has been. Yeah.
given us freedom. Free. You have given us freedom. You have given us freedom. My chains are gone. Oh. We'll see you this evening at 6 o'clock. Have a great afternoon.